get better. Uh, Dr. Virginia Lytle is going to talk with us next. Uh, Dr. Lytle is a professor of surgery and uh, chief of thoracic surgery at Boston University Medical Center, uh, where she is also the head of the uh, thoracic surgery clinical research program. Dr. Lytle. Great. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk this morning. So we've heard about uh, communicating. Uh, surgeons, as surgeons, we don't really want to, uh, obviously, we, we are trained to learn how to communicate in the operating room relatively well, because we have to, or otherwise we couldn't get the operation done. But we typically don't like to communicate when something goes bad, because we just want to just put it behind us and forget it never happened. Well, obviously, that's not the correct way to address that, because we don't really want bad things to happen again. So we've heard about adverse events from Dr. Walsh and how to deal with those. So I'm going to talk, I'm going to try to bridge those two areas and uh, explain how we can uh, deal with adverse events and try to reduce uh, uh, or improve patient outcomes afterwards so mistakes aren't made again. But how uh, patients are not injured, but also the providers are injured too. So I'll start with a case study. So this is a 50-year-old woman, and she underwent a uh, poem procedure for achalasia. Intraoperatively, she uh, developed a left uh, pneumothorax, and a pigtail was placed. She then became hypotensive. Anesthesia was getting uh, discombobulated about the fact that she was having a pneumothorax, and it had to be placed urgently. Uh, so the procedure took a while. It, the patient came through it. However, she had a barium swallow the next day, and unfortunately, she had an esophageal leak into the chest. She had a repeat endoscopy. More clips were applied to the mucosotomy, but uh, this resulted, this did not solve the problem. She continued to have a leak, and she subsequently needed major interventions to recover from all this. Eventually, she did recover, but uh, the patient was obviously not too happy about this, but neither were the team members. Not necessarily the surgical team, although they were not happy that this happened, but also the anesthesia team, the, the nurses, the powers that be. So this is an adverse event. So this is the kind of situation that uh, a root cause analysis would be an appropriate way to, to, to deal with this. Now, root cause analyses are commonly applied in business, finance, and other specialties and professions and it's relevant to us in surgery as well. Do remember that the procedures that we do are considered just the index procedures, you know, aside from the, the complex, you know, multidisciplinary team type procedures, but pneumonectomies and esophagectomies are in the same category as Whipple's as being the most uh, potentially complex or complicated operations that are done by surgeons. So adverse events can happen and will happen. So what is a root cause analysis? A root cause analysis is you have an adverse event, multiple team members and, and uh, the patient also, but they're not involved in the root cause analysis. The root, the, those who are involved need to come together and figure out why did this happen, who is responsible, or not necessarily who is responsible, because it's not about you know, blaming people. It's about trying to come together and come up with a plan uh, that uh, will prevent this from happening again in the future. So some of the important aspects, of course, are in the root cause analysis are to uh, uh, itemize what happened, the, co the complications, and again, then the team members that were involved, and who that is the accountable party, and then implement action items to prevent this from happening again. So, uh, you would provide a, you have a written timeline of events, and then you uh, apply writers or reporters techniques of the, the, the W's, right? The who, the when, the where, the how, the why, there's one H in there, and the what. So you want to come up with a list of what was involved in this complication. So it's important initially for the root cause analysis process to have a facilitator. So after uh, the risk management team has uh, evaluated the problem and, and gone through and come up with the timeline and, and sort of outlined all these other things, then you all have to come together. The, uh, a, the facilitator could be uh, a surgeon who is familiar with the procedure but was not involved in the procedure, someone who's not really supposed to not be biased about how this all happened and trying to, for example, you wouldn't want someone who says, oh, this is my junior partner, you know, they never 
it, you know, they're, they're just learning how to do this. The patient actually did fine in the end, so it's all okay. You don't want someone like that. You need someone who doesn't have any, any stake involved in this. So the facilitator would, come, would be the leader of the, of the discussion. We would have the risk management, someone who uh, had put together the timeline and all the Ws, and they would be present at this, at this meeting. Uh, the surgeon, residents, the anesthesiologist, the anesthesia residents, scrub techs, circulating nurses, sometimes the biomedical engineer needs to be involved depending on what happened, and of course it's appropriate to have the OR nurse manager because uh, she or he is in charge of, of the, the other OR nurses. And the facilitator will review what is the hospital policy, what is, was the hospital policy adhered to for whatever, you know, was being done in the operating room and that we could have, uh, uh, maybe perhaps the hospital policy wasn't followed and that's, that is the reason why this uh, complication occurred. Was it a staffing issue? Was there not enough people in the room to help deal with this? Uh, or enough experienced people to identify a complication, a potential complication and prevent it from happening? Was there enough supervision, training? Was the equipment working right? So that's maybe where biomed might come in. And then we need to identify a, uh, an appropriate storyteller. So obviously the surgeon who was engaged in the, in the procedure would, would have their view of what happened. Uh, and maybe they're the most appropriate one to at least say, you know, this is the sequence of events. Of course, they have to uh, remove all emotions and be able to, to give it as a, almost like a third party objective viewer. And then someone needs to be responsible for discussing the roles of all these players. So stepping back, uh, returning to this case, uh, so the root cause analysis of this, when, when this case is reviewed, uh, the surgeon certainly was um, uh, um, one of the, um, uh, accountable parties, but it turns out that so was some of the staff. They weren't familiar with doing this procedure and then setting up the endoscopy, the endoscope, and, and making the connections uh, and confirming that the connections were correct. And the biomed engineer uh, probably should have been involved in, in evaluating this to make sure that some of the tubing was right and what was going through that tubing. So one of the uh, factors that impacted this patient's care was that instead of insufflating with CO2, which can be reabsorbed, air was being insufflated and probably was uh, um, contributing to the development of the pneumothorax and could have resulted in pneumoperitoneum as well. And of course, you know, when you insufflate with all this and you get this, uh, comp these complications, then the, um, the anesthesiologists are upset and perhaps the, the surgeon needed to communicate and the team needed to communicate with the anesthesiologist, look, this is a complication that can happen for this procedure. We need to be aware, we need to be prepared. So there was a fault in the communication between the uh, OR team. So when you do the root cause analysis, it has to be orderly. And the goal, again, is to look forward to try to come up with an action plan to prevent future problems. And we need to have looked at the timeline and see where was the mistake, where was the problem here. And the problem in this case was that, again, the, the incorrect um, insufflation uh, gas in a sense, or air, instead of using CO2, air was being used, so that was, that was one of the problems. But also, it was a matter of if you're doing a procedure that maybe hadn't been done in the operating room, it wasn't like doing appendectomy where, where many, you know, the OR staff would be used to doing this, you know, because uh, it's a relatively routine procedure, but when you're introducing innovative or new uh, procedures in the operating room, you have to make sure everyone's on board and remember that you know, you're not always gonna get your, you're the same nurse or the, or the same uh, circulator, and certainly you're not always gonna get the same anesthesiologist. So it's all a matter of um, trying to remember that uh, it's about communicating, especially when you're uh, introducing new uh, uh, techniques. And then after the root cause analysis is carried out, again, led by the facilitator, which isn't necessarily someone from the risk management team, but they were there, you also want to have um, a facilitator would, would be uh, typically, again, a surgeon. Uh, a corrective plan would be implemented, and that could go back to the risk management or uh, person. It doesn't have to be on, uh, placed on the, the physician who certainly has a lot of other commitments, too. So why is this important? This is important because uh, of the second victim uh, trajectory. So the second victim phenomenon was described by an Albert Wu about 20 years ago. 
And what we see in the second victim is that uh, some who experienced this, this is so the, f the first victim, of course, is the patient in, in this particular case, and, and in the cases that we're talking about adverse events and surgery. Uh, but the second victim is other team members, and frequently, obviously, it's the, the surgeon or physician involved. So there's various stages, and in stage one is that there's the accident. You know, the accident happened, people are upset, you know, tubes are being placed and not necessarily, or, you know, patients are decompensating in the operating room, and so there's chaos. Uh, and then uh, the patient has the complication, and then there's uh, the, the, the surgeon afterwards is obviously upset about this uh, and is having a lot of reflection about how um, negative um, or fears that uh, they have done something wrong, because perhaps they have, uh, and obviously they should be taking responsibility for it, but they, it's hard for them to function and go on, because it's not like you do a case and then uh, don't have any other cases to do. You could have a complicated case, but you still have other patients that need to be cared for and other procedures that need to be done. So these intrusive reflections can impact their, their function on future cases in the immediate period post-complication. Post, uh, post so the next stage is that the, uh, the surgeon, uh, in this case, uh, needs to restore their personal integrity. They need to feel like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm, I'm, I really, uh, maybe, maybe I shouldn't be a surgeon at all. Um, you know, my, my colleagues think I am totally incompetent. Uh, and they have to, they may need some help on trying to figure out that, um, you know, this is an adverse event. There's a way to deal with this. There's a way to um, identify actionable items so that you can get through this. And again, patients can be protected. And uh, they have to endure um, you know, the risk management people coming after them and going through things. And so that can obviously make them feel beat up even more. Uh, and finally, um, after they've gone through all their stages here, the surgeon and could either get through it and thrive if they have um, uh, had the right support and be able to recognize that, okay, this is a problem, but this is how we're gonna prevent this problem from happening in the future. Or they may just survive, they may go on, but they may say, oh boy, I really, I, I just don't think I can do this very well, but this is my job, so I'll get up and do my job again. I gotta bring home some money, you know, send the kids to school. So, so they're just surviving, but they're not thriving. Or they could just drop out. They could say, oh my God, you know, I, I killed this patient and there's no way I can go on. Uh, obviously, we don't really want to see this. It doesn't help anyone. So uh, a, a CR Denim described in the Journal of Patient Safety many years ago, the five rights of the second victim. You wouldn't think that the second victim had any rights. It's all about the patient. It is all, a lot about the patient, of course, but there are, again, uh, second and third victims. So the five rights of the second victim, so you're familiar with these, are that uh, the treatment uh, is just, that the, uh, the, the second victim is respected, um, that there's an understanding and compassion for the second victim, that they, if they need supportive care, that their supervisor or their colleagues can help offer them some supportive care, and that everyone is transparent about the events and that the second victim is, uh, again, a victim. And why do we care about this? Uh, because Physicians and surgeons go through a lot of training, surgeons in particular, because that's what we all are, uh, and we don't want to uh, lose them because it's a lot has been invested in this time. And uh, burnout and career satisfaction has, have been uh, major topics, and as I'm sure many in the room are familiar, you know, the WHO about a week ago came out with a definition to find burnout as an actual uh, diagnosis. So burnout is a, is a big, uh, big term here. And, Burnout and career satisfaction in American surgeons from a study from uh, several years ago, about 10 years ago now, showed that, um, let's see, that, sorry, uh, let me go on here. You know, when, the, when surgeons um, it, um, are feeling burned out, then it, it can be because they're not having enough time for their family, that they're, they're just not, uh, their quality of life scores are, are low and um, that uh, it doesn't um, impact, uh, it doesn't improve 
their recommendations or advising their family to go on as for the career, to pursue careers as surgeons or physicians. So uh, just in summary, uh, remember that uh, there's always adverse events do happen, uh, but there's a way to deal with them so that we don't have not only the, the primary victim, but also the second victims. And the most important thing here is, of course, premium non uh, no cherry, patient comes first, don't first do no harm, but adverse events happen. But you can't just say, ACS la vida. Uh, no, you have to investigate, you have to debrief. And we do this because uh, we all want to uh, maintain uh, happy, healthy uh, uh, staff and, and uh, um, surgical group so that we can care for our patients and um, uh, obtain a um, sense of wellness and accomplishment and satisfaction for what we do. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. 